Hi, this is Angela. Welcome back to the Bravo Docket. This is one of our legal briefs, and I am doing this one with John, my husband, who you guys have heard on the podcast before, because Ceci's trial has restarted. So send her lots of good thoughts and vibes for her trial. We are going to be discussing some of the things that have gone on in the trial of multi-platinum rapper Young Thug, aka Jeffrey Williams. And this is currently going on in Atlanta, and at this point, they haven't even been able to pick a jury yet because so many things have gone on prior to the trial. So, John, why don't you tell us a little bit about this case? Young Thug, a.k.a. Jeffrey Williams, is the most well-known defendant in this trial. He's facing eight counts in the 65-count indictment, with prosecutors alleging that he's the leader of a subset of the Bloods called Young Slime Life that the prosecution claims are responsible for murders and other violence in the Atlanta area. Young Thug is extremely famous. He has 25 gold and platinum RIAA certifications. He's headlined music festivals. He's gone on groundbreaking tours like the Justin Bieber Big Tour, which also features some of his fellow YSL artists. John, do you want to talk a little bit about Young Thug's style? Uh, Sure, I'd love to. Young Thug has received both praise and criticism for his eccentric and unique vocal style, which has been described as departing from traditional rap lyricism and sometimes intelligible meaning. Jeff Weiss of BBC called him the most influential rapper of the 21st century. According to The Fader, in a typical Young Thug verse, he slurs, shouts, whines, and sings feverishly, contorting his voice into a series of odd timbers like a beautifully played but broken wind instrument. Pitchfork called his style extraordinarily distinctive and a weird experimental approach to rapping while praising his presence, persona, mystique, and star power. (laughs) Billboard wrote that Thug uses his multiplicative vocal delivery to his advantage. Where another rapper might lapse into repetition, he finds a new way to distress and warp his tone. Complex noted his aptitude for creating catchy, melodic hooks. XXL called him a, quote, rap weirdo, stating that, quote, Thug's charisma, unhinged flow, and hooks make his music intriguing. Critic Sheldon Pierce wrote that Thug understands the modern pop song construction better than anyone. Anything and everything can be a hook. I just wanted to bring some of this stuff up because before we talk about someone as a criminal defendant and what they're being accused of, especially if you're not familiar with this person, I think it's important to give some of their background and history as to why they're famous. And we won't get into his personal life, all of that. This is supposed to be a mini episode, but he's really gotten a lot of critical claim for his music, as well as the popular claim from all of his albums being sold. Now on to the introduction of this court case, which again, hasn't even started yet because they haven't been able to pick a jury. John, I'm going to have you talk a little bit about this. On May 9th, 2022, Fulton County prosecutors announced the indictment of Williams as well as rappers Sergio Rana Kitchens, Arnold Lil Duke Martinez, DeMonte Yak Gotti Kendrick, Williams' brother Quantavius Greer, and 23 other people that District Attorney Fonnie Willis accused of being part of a YSL criminal organization. Their defense attorneys have repeatedly stated their innocence, with Williams' lawyer, Brian Steele, declaring, Mr. Williams committed no crime whatsoever, and we will fight my last drop of blood to clear him. Fulton County, Georgia District Attorney Fonnie Willis said the following in a statement, quote, We are proud to bring forth this indictment and hopefully to bring justice to a lot of the community who was victimized through the course you see in this indictment. But more importantly, the most important thing we are here to do is keep this community safe. So I wanted to talk a little bit about who the district attorney is. She graduated from Howard University and Emory University School of Law, and she spent 16 years as a prosecutor in the Fulton County District Attorney's Office. Her most prominent case was the prosecution of the Atlantic Public Schools cheating scandal. In 2018, she went into private practice, and then in 2020, Willis was elected as district attorney for Fulton County, defeating Paul Howard Jr., a six-term incumbent and her former boss. She was interviewed in Time Magazine, the daughter of a former Black Panther who recently retired as a criminal defense lawyer, the Inglewood, California-born Willis would go along when her father went to court on Saturday mornings. The judge who oversaw the Saturday courtroom, an older white man, was, according to Willis, known to be mean. But each week, he had Willis, too young to stay home alone or to hear the details her father needed to discuss with his clients, sit next to him on the elevated dais, the two whispering back and forth. One day, Willis's father asked her what on earth they talked about. I said, he's asking me, should they go home or should they go to the back, Willis says with glee. The back meant jail. One day after court, the judge asked Willis what she wanted to do when she grew up. When she said she wanted to be a judge, he told her 
she would first have to become a lawyer, a person who reads a lot and explains the law. Willis told him she could read, so she could certainly do that. And I've never wanted to be anything else, Willis says. Also, another note, we're not going to get into this here, but she may announce charges against Trump in July 2023. You can Google it. So the next character in this is the RICO Act. And if you are interested in the RICO Act, go back to our Hells Angels and the Girardi Family Enterprise episode for some fascinating details on the history of RICO. But John, I'm going to have you read a little bit about it here. The sweeping statute has been used to take down the mafia and, quote, some of the highest profile organized crime families by linking crime bosses to the crimes committed by the subordinates over several years. Under the law, prosecutors can stitch together crimes from extortion and loan sharking to murder to argue that the group is operating as a single enterprise. Georgia's RICO law, under which Williams is charged, is similar in that it criminalizes anyone accused of participating in an, quote, interrelated pattern of racketeering and criminal activity. However, prosecutors also must prove that a defendant committed at least two predicate crimes, such as burglary or homicide, that were, quote, committed as part of an enterprise engaging in a pattern of racketeering activity. Fonnie Willis in the Fulton County District Attorney's Office's theory behind Williams' charges, Williams' young thug, is that he is the founder of Young Slime Life, which is YSL, which is supposedly a blood-affiliated Atlanta street gang sharing the same initials as Williams' record label, Young Stoner Life. Like its federal counterpart, Georgia's RICO Act seeks to stamp out organized crime. Within the 56 or 65 count indictment in which the charges against Williams are filed, charges against other individuals allegedly affiliated with Young Slime Life include murder, armed robbery, drug dealing, and other crimes related to supposed gang activity. To try to paint Williams as the leader of Young Slime Life, Williams is alleged to have committed several crimes for which he is not being charged, including renting a getaway car used in the murder of a rival gang leader and dealing methamphetamine. In this mini episode, we're not going to cover the trial because it hasn't started yet, so we can't. And we're not going to cover the background of the charges in detail. We'll wait until we cover the trial at some point. But what we're uncovering here is some of the things that happened as jury selection has been ongoing. The whole thing's kind of been a circus, but that's not the judge's fault. I want to make it very clear that the judge in this case is very well respected in the Atlanta bar, and his background is interesting. John, will you tell us a little bit about Chief Judge Glanville? Sure. Chief Judge Glanville was born in Columbus, Ohio. He attended Brevard College and joined ROTC there. In 1982, he attended the University of Georgia and joined the Army Reserve Officer Training Corps program. Upon graduating, he was commissioned as Infantry Second Lieutenant, but he delayed his military service to attend law school at the University of Georgia. After receiving his degree, he served on active duty from 1990 through 1993 and then joined the 213 Legal Operations Detachment, where he served in several positions. In 1998, he was selected as Chief of Operational and Civil Law for the 2125th Garrison Support Unit. In 2000, he served as the Command Judge Advocate for the 359th Signal Brigade and was then selected to serve as the Staff Judge Advocate for the 335th Signal Command. As a 335th SGA, he deployed in support of Operation Iraqi Freedom. Following this, he served as the Commanding General of North Atlantic Treaty Organization Rule of Law Support Mission Rule of Law Field Force Afghanistan. Good job. Thank you. He was then promoted to Brigadier General, Chief Judge in Army Court of Criminal Appeals. Chief Judge Granville was the first Black Reserve Judge Advocate to be promoted to General Officer. In his civilian legal career, Chief Judge Glanville worked as a prosecutor with the County Solicitor General's Office and then the Fulton County Solicitor General's Office. He also worked as a defense attorney for the United States Army Trial Defense Service. He served as Fulton County Judge for 26 years, first on the Fulton County Magistrate Court for eight years, and then on the Fulton County Superior Court for the past 18 years. So this, this judge is extremely experienced. He has a great background. And in my opinion, it's fantastic when you have a judge that has experience both as a prosecutor and a defense attorney, because that way the judge understands the challenges and frustrations that both sides face in criminal trials. Okay, so what has happened to make jury selection in this trial such a circus before it even starts? And why are all these things happening? Part of it, in my opinion, is the structure and prosecution of RICO claims with the massive list of co-defendants being tried at the same time and the anticipated length of trial. So that required that a ton of potential jurors be called. Since January, 1,200 jurors have been summoned. 300 more jurors were summoned on April 28th, and a seventh group of jurors will report in May. 
As a result, the jury selection could extend to the summer with trial beginning sometime in June or July. I don't think it's going to start in June or July. I think it's going to take too long. So there's several issues causing the jury selection to last so long. The main issue is that many of the potential jurors have submitted a claim for hardship. With over 300 potential witnesses, some expect the trial to last about nine months. And so as a result, potential jurors would need to commit to being available until fall or winter of 2023. And that's assuming that they can get selected and get this case started. Is this also because they could be uh, potentially... I forget what the word is, but put up in a hotel like the O.J. Simpson case and not allowed to have any sort of media or electronics. Sequestered. Sequestered. Thank you. Yes. The judge has not ordered that yet, but this trial has a list of 300 potential witnesses, and many of them are famous people. So I could see that possibly happening. So let's talk about some of the events that have happened so far. On January 12th, Judge Glanville penalized a citizen who skipped out on jury selection for the Dominican Republic by making her write a 30-page essay on the importance of jury service in lieu of a contempt of court charge. Now, I know a lot of people reacted to this and thought that was maybe unfair to the potential juror as a trial attorney who thinks that jury trials are incredibly important. We need smart jurors. We need the jurors to show up. I think that was pretty reasonable if you're going to skip out on your civic duty. Wait, a 30-page essay? Though, if your average citizen had to write a 30-page essay? He wanted her to learn the importance of jury service without having a contempt charge. Is this, is this double-spaced? Or is it is there a bibliography that you can fill some of those pages with? Or is it just strict I didn't look to see writing an essay? if there was a word count or a font size limitation. And at this point, you could use chat GPT to do look, it. I've gone to like grad school, and I didn't have to write a 30-page essay. It was so. a, You went to art school. It was still, there's documents that had to be written <laughs> during that time, all right? It wasn't all just finger painting. God. Let's move on. Let's move on. Also, you're going to jury duty next week. I have it on the calendar. You're going. Oh, my God. So. I'm going to write a 30-page essay. Yeah, I'm going. I'm going to make you write a 30-page essay if you don't go. So then a week later, on January 19th, prosecutors filed a motion alleging that Williams, again, that's Young Thug, obtained a pill from his co-defendant, Khalif Adams, during a handshake. Fulton County court deputies allegedly caught Williams with weed and tobacco on him, and he was taken to Grady Hospital after allegedly ingesting some of the contraband. Prior to these incidents, proceedings were disrupted by two other defendants allegedly attempting to smuggle weed into jail. I mean, I get that you can't have it in jail, but I don't think weed should be illegal. Yeah, I agree with that. Anywhere. Then in April of this year, juror 1004 was arrested and accused of recording proceedings at the Fulton County Courthouse on March 17th. Judge Glanville ordered deputies to take her phone. Now, here's an example, I think, of where this judge is sort of setting the stage. You've got more than 1,200 jurors showing up. It's very difficult for government resources to keep all of these people managed and organized. The courthouse staff is burdened by this, and he has got to set a precedent that you, you know, sort of F around and find out. You don't want to do that. It was a clear violation of the rule. He had said it many times. You're not allowed to record. You cannot be posting these things on your social media and you can't do it. So I I don't have a problem with the judge doing that because you have to. Is there always this sort of just complications with anybody famous, I would assume, with in a trial of getting a jury selected and having to have this many potential people be interviewed for the job, basically, because the person is famous. I think it's also the number of defendants, too. It's not just the length of trial. There's, what is 28, 30 something defendants. And so it can't be somebody that is familiar with the defendant. It, there's just so many things that go into it. Both sides need the opportunity to find people that can give a fair result. The prosecution wants someone that will give a fair shake to their argument. And then the defense obviously wants to find the person that will give their defendant a fair trial. And finding somebody that fits the bill for both of those with this many defendants and these type of charges is always going to be difficult. I think that's part of the reason why it may have been perhaps not the best decision to bring this as a RICO case because it was going to be a circus with this many defendants and this many moving parts. Charging these people individually for their crimes is one thing, but then charging everyone as a whole and saying they're all connected, I can understand the strategy of the prosecutor and wanting to do that, hoping people would fold and, you know, sort of rat each other out. But I don't know as far as getting the result 
that she wants if that's going to happen. I mean, even if this trial goes on, there's just a high probability that there's going to be something that could be grounds for a mistrial with that many witnesses. RICO cases are very difficult to bring. Especially with famous people. Especially with famous people. Yeah, and again, go back and listen to our Hells Angels and the Girardi Family Enterprise episode. The leader of the Hells Angels was charged. He was, I think, one of the first people to be charged with a, a RICO case that was not in the mafia. And he was able to beat the charges and to use the media and press to his advantage to sort of make his case for himself. RICO is difficult. It's difficult to prove. Now, this is, of course, the Georgia law and not the federal law. And so it may be easier under the Georgia law to do a RICO case. So going back to the juror, after the judge took her phone, she was initially sent to jail for for three to five days, but then she was released after five hours. So the judge did make an example of her, but she got out of jail after five hours. I mean, honestly, I mean, the judge said you can't do it. It was well known. Everybody knew it. She did it anyway. And you you do kind of have to make an example of people with this much stuff going on. So then on Monday, May 1st, Dennis Byron, who's been covering the trial, shared some updates on Twitter. And according to Byron, quote, drama erupted in the courtroom after a potential juror called the presiding judge a bitch. You can't you can't do that. Now, they're still just interviewing to be they're still just interviewing to be on the jury. Yeah, it's it's first of all, I wouldn't call this I wouldn't call this judge a name anyway. This is a I mean, but I dude, mean, dude's a general. Isn't she just trying to get out of it? I don't know what her I don't know what prompted this. All I have is this tweet stating that a potential juror called the judge a bitch, which is I'm just looking for my potential outs. You're not getting out of jury for next week. People out there do not be like John. Go to jury duty. This is one of the only countries in the entire world that lets its citizens decide facts using their common sense. And it is so important that we keep our jury system the way that it is because it keeps the law from becoming too esoteric because you have to be able to explain the law and explain either the criminal or civil case in plain language. And if we stop having that, it's going to be bad for everyone. It should be a, a point of great pride to be able to serve on a jury. I agree with Angela. Do not try to be like me. And no, you're you're going. I'm holding you in contempt right now. You're being held in contempt by me, That's fine. your wife. I accept that. Oh, my God. Okay. So the person who was tweeting this asked a question. He said, the judge held her in contempt of court. Was her comment protected under the First Amendment? Hashtag young thug. And then he said in another tweet, quote, I thought the word was protected speech under the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Lawyers chime in. Well, I'm a lawyer. I'm going to chime in. But first, John, I want I want to just ask you as a non-lawyer, do you think that that's protected speech? So we discussed this over brunch today, and I was confused uh, by this by the nuance of this. I I did believe that like freedom of speech, you can say things. But I realized through our quick conversation over our steak and eggs was basically that yes, you can speak freely, but there are still consequences to your actions if you speak freely. Well, kind of. So, wait, why are you laughing? I don't know. I'm sorry. I just realized how idiotic I must have sounded. You didn't, you don't sound idiotic. (laughs) In fact, I think most people in the United States misunderstand what freedom of speech actually means. You know, people go to law school because they want to argue constitutional issues. It's very rare to be able to get to do that. I've actually been able to argue First Amendment law in federal court. So one thing to understand about freedom of speech is that there can be limitations. And one of those limitations can be time, place, and manner restrictions. And those are subjected to strict scrutiny. So if there's time, place, and manner restrictions on speech where the government is saying, we are going to abridge your right of free speech in this time, place, and manner for whatever reason, it has to have a very important reason to do that. It can't just be like, we don't want you saying that here. I have a quick question about that. Uh-oh. Does anybody else have this power besides the government? This applies to the government. Now, corporations are not the government. Corporations can say, I don't want you talking this way. That's different. So, for example, if you're talking about Elon Musk popping up, deciding who gets to be on Twitter or not, that's a privately held corporation. So you can't say, but I have free speech. It's not about that. It's saying the government shall make no law abridging free speech. Our Constitution protects us against the government, not against corporations in that Example. Does that make sense? Why are you making that face me? I guess I was a bit confused. So the government made the Freedom of Speech Act 
No, it's in, that's in the Constitution. The Constitu- I know it's in the Constitution. Oh okay, God. I'm aware it's in the Constitution. <laughs> they made that. It's the, it's the first for, amendment to the Constitution. Is whatever, totally whatever in amendment it is. Oh, my God. I don't do numbers. <laughs> oh, my God. But it's only for other people to abide by. The government, though, can say, well, freedom of speech... Unless it's this time or this place or this sort no, of situation. No, that's the, that's the opposite of what I just said. Oh, I thought that's what you said. No, when the people created our constitution and the amendments to the constitution, they are stopping the government from restricting free speech. Okay. In employment stuff, it's different. But a private corporation can say, I don't want this speech on my holy privately owned social media site and they can take it down. And then that's then it's in the United States, we leave that up to capitalism to decide if that survives or not. Yeah. So she was okay for calling the guy a bitch then. No. Where are you getting this from? Well, because that's government. So. No, God. Let me finish explaining (laughs) time, place, and manner restrictions. So sorry. The government and the courts, including the United States Supreme Court, have found that in a court of law where a judge is presiding, there is an appropriate time, place, and manner restriction for when you can and cannot speak. So, for example, if this person who called the judge a bitch wanted to picket outside the courthouse in public, you know, government property and say, I think this judge is a bitch with a sign, they could do that. However, they are obstructing justice and obstructing the court proceedings by calling the judge a bitch in the courtroom while they've been summoned for jury selection. So it's a time, place and manner. You can't do that in the courtroom. You are free to call the judge a bitch. I don't recommend it, but you're free to do it in an appropriate time, place, and manner that's not inside the courtroom. You can put up signs in, on your own property saying, Judge so-and-so is a bitch. Again, I don't recommend doing that, but you can do it. I, you... I get it. So okay. Th- this makes sense because then that means that during the courtroom, the, the actual uh, during the actual trial, you can't have jury members just standing up being like, screw this, I don't believe that, or he's wrong. It, it makes everyone be quiet yeah. during that time so they can just get through the process and do it fairly. Yeah. Okay. And to be clear, most of the time, the people getting held in contempt are lawyers for violating court orders. It's not often members of the public that are doing this. So this person that called the judge a bitch has freedom of speech and can do that. They just can't do it in the courtroom. But our government will say, yeah, you can say all kinds of horrible things. I mean, you and I lived in Kansas where the Fred Phelps people were, and they got to picket my law school graduation with all kinds of horrible stuff because they have the freedom of speech to do that but they couldn't they couldn't yell those things to a judge in a courtroom and they knew that because a lot of them are lawyers so that's what that means makes sense so to make sure this is clear as far as a court's contempt power is concerned a person charged with contempt of court and making certain utterances or publishing writings which clearly constitute a contempt, may not ordinarily escape liability by merely invoking constitutional guarantees of freedom of speech in the press, obstructing by means of spoken or written word, the administration of justice in the courts has been described as an abuse of the liberty of speech or press and will subject the abuser to punishment for contempt of court. Now, contempt, like I'm saying, based on an out-of-court statement, has been said to involve constitutionally guaranteed liberty of free expression and That can only be punished in cases where there's a clear and present danger to the administration of justice. So here's some examples. In one case where a woman picketed a courthouse with a sandwich sign advocating, among other things, the removal of 63 percent of the Irish Catholic politicians from all offices at the time of a negligence trial in the courthouse in which the attorney for the corporate defendant, the president of the corporate defendant and the presiding judge were all of Irish Catholic ancestry, the woman's conviction for contempt was reversed on appeal in a very brief opinion. In another opinion, a contempt conviction was also reversed where, during the trial of a civil action for the collection of rent, the trial judge observed a man picketing the courthouse with a sign urging the impeachment of the trial judge for, quote, using a policy of discrimination against members of the white race. The appellate court emphasized, among other things, that no warning had been given to the picketing person to discontinue demonstrating around the courthouse, and that he apparently had no knowledge that court was in session or that his picketing was interfering with the regular conduct of court's business. Now, contempt convictions of several defendants were affirmed in one case where the defendants, angry over a judge's decision in certain contempt cases arising out of a strike, picketed the judge's home in addition to sending allegedly insulting letters to the judge. The appellate court emphasized, in part, that the picketing related to matters which were still pending before the judge's court, since only some of the contempt cases arising out of the labor dispute had been heard at the time of the picketing. So you can see where there's, you know, a certain line drawn, and certain jurisdictions may have found differently on that, but there is there is a line. 
you're, if you're making the judge afraid to rule a certain way while cases are going on, that interferes with court proceedings. So you can see the clear difference there. While those other couple examples, they did get charged with contempt and then that got overturned. Here, the appellate court, when that was appealed, said, no, you can't do that. And that, I think those types of cases make sense in explaining how that works. If I get charged with contempt, what's that look like on my like permanent record? Is it like always there, contempt? Or does it go away immediately when I'm released? No. If it's so there's different. There's civil contempt, which is what typically what attorneys get in trouble for, and then there's criminal contempt. And it, this is not a common thing that happened, but it is a criminal charge, and so it would be like any other, and it's probably gonna be a misdemeanor. And so when am you, I getting a job? Like well, they look at that on my like resume or my 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 application and be like, sorry, we can't hire you. Well, n- you got something on your criminal record. Not unless you manage to commit felony contempt, which I don't know how you would even do. I haven't even heard of a felony contempt There's no charge. such thing as felony contempt. There probably point. is, but I haven't heard of it, and I haven't seen anyone convicted of it. But it, there probably is. Okay, thank you. So, what do, what do you think a permanent record is? I don't. You know, I I. It still goes back to like grade school. I never let it go. <laughs> like permanent records, I still think about you think them. The I still worry like, about has it. Has like I a st- file on you somewhere where you have little marks yeah, against yeah, you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so you stood against the wall during recess, huh? What'd you do? Okay, one of the things that we also got questions about were the fact that this indictment against Young Thug quoted his rap lyrics. The prosecutor trying to use his lyrics in his songs against him in court. I don't like it personally. I don't like it legally for a lot of reasons, but that's one of the things they're trying to do. And that's one of the things that I think went kind of viral, even in these trial proceedings, because the judge was reading out the charges and included in the charges were quotes from his rap lyrics. In Williams' trial, lyrics from four of his songs for the past six years will be used as evidence against him if the prosecution can get them admitted at trial. One of the main lyrics cited in the indictment comes from Williams' song, Slatty which describes killing a man in front of his family without, quote, unquote, leaving a trace. The indictment also cites the prominent display of YSL and Williams music videos over the same period. Within the context of the RICO charge, the prosecution claims that these lyrics and symbols in Williams music videos meet the element of preserving, protecting, and enhancing the reputation, power, and territory of the criminal enterprise. Okay, like I've already said, I don't like this for a lot of reasons. When I was first reading about this for this episode, I immediately thought about how so many country singers talk about murder and criminal activities in their songs. But I couldn't think of one court case where song lyrics were used against a country music singer or something. It's not like they don't break the law all the time. They do. I'm not even a fan of contemporary country music, but even I can name a bunch of songs where female country singers talk about killing men or their husbands, you know, like Goodbye Earl. The whole song's about murder. And then Miranda Lambert's Gunpowder and Lead. And then a country music singer I actually really like, Johnny Cash, Folsom Prison Blues. He literally sings, I shot a man in Reno just to watch him die. And I'm not saying one of these cases doesn't exist where a country music singer has their lyrics used against them. I just can't think of one. And I couldn't find one when I Googled it. And it turns out I'm not the only person who had this thought. And it has been researched and written about by some incredibly smart people. There's a book called Rap on Trial, Race, Lyrics, and Guilt in America, and it was written by Andrea Dennis and Eric Nelson. And I encourage you to read it if you're interested in this topic. So one of the first cases where rap lyrics were used as criminal evidence came about in the early 90s amid a moral panic about the influence of gangster rap. And if you're interested in moral panics, listen to the podcast called You're Wrong About. That's one of the podcast that I really love that actually influenced the way we do our podcast. Anyway, it's called You're Wrong About, and there's tons of stuff on there about moral panics. I think it's fascinating. Anyway, the case most commonly cited as the first to use rap music as evidence in a criminal trial was 1991's United States v. Foster, where a Seventh Circuit appeals court upheld the conviction of Derek Foster, whose prosecution relied on rap lyrics he wrote about drugs and narcotics trafficking. Another early high-profile example was Snoop Dogg's 1993 murder trial in which he was acquitted. The prosecution used lyrics from his track, Murder on the Case, during closing arguments. I I still don't understand how they got away with that. It's a song. Right, but you're on trial for murder, and he wrote a song called Murder Was the Case. I think that's ridiculous. That has no place in a courtroom. Unless you are writing a song that literally word for word says exactly what you did, and you call it My Confession— 
and it fits every single piece of evidence that the police find, unless that's it. If I were the judge, I'm not letting it in. It's uh, not. I, I agree with that. I totally agree. Okay. You're an artist. You're doing all these paintings. How many, for example, how many skulls do you have painted? And like your, what about your weird ass drawings in your sketchbook? Which, by the way, I love and they're really good. But you draw some weird but stuff. Even you would be concerned if you saw really specific drawings of some dark material in my sketchbooks. You might corner me on that and ask me about what these drawings pertain to. That's different. I'm your wife. <laughs> it's, it's like American Psycho when the secretary finds the journal of oh, all the God. sketches. <laughs> he doesn't have American Psycho sketches. But I mean, I'm your wife. That's different as far as it getting in and being played in front of a jury. I, d I don't think that's okay. I think this is an interesting, this is a broader topic. I think there's a lot actually here that's very interesting. Yeah. I, you know, I just don't think that's okay. So there's another case called People versus Oleguin, and I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly. It's O-L-G-U-I-N, and that was from 1994. And that one has arguably had the biggest influence in the use of this tactic as using rap lyrics in a trial. And for the case in which Cesar Javier Oleguin and Francisco Calderon Mora, a part-time DJ, were convicted of second-degree murder for the killing of a rival gang member who had defaced their gang-related graffiti, the prosecution submitted rap lyrics found in Mora's home that made reference to violence in gang culture generally. While the defense argued that it couldn't be proven that Mora wrote the lyrics and that their use as evidence could mislead the jury, the prosecution successfully used them. And this case is also largely considered as the seminal precedent for citing lyrics as evidence. I'd like to see those lyrics, though. I'd be curious. I'm looking at it as, see, but that's the problem. You're not a lawyer. And so you're I'm looking at it like just I'm as, the juror. I'm the juror. Yeah. But I want to see the lyrics. That just shows how pre like prejudicial it is. As a lawyer, this does not hold up to the foundation, authentication, the bias, the potential bias as opposed to the potential relevance of whether or not it's going to prove a fact of issue to the termination of the action, there's too much potential bias there, and it's not helpful to the trier of fact. I would not allow it. No, I, get, I get your point. That's my ruling. I'm just, if I murdered somebody, I probably would lay off murder lyrics for like a year. You know, I would just hold off on some <laughs> new murder songs for like a year. Then I'd go back to writing them, but... But you'd have murder. Not on... out the gate. Not but right after it happened. Even, but you'd have murder on your mind because you were just tried. For... True. I would have murder on the mind, but I would. I would have murder on the mind, but I would. I would just put that in a journal for future use. But then your journal. That see, a journal is actually good. A secret at... journal. A, a Nobody journal. would know about a it. A journal's actually... under the bed. A journal's good evidence, though. A journal is a daily cataloging of your events and the things that were important to you. And there, I have no problem with journals under the right circumstances, being entered into evidence. But uh, aren't songs just a journal? Now you're just arguing just to argue. <laughs> so there are some legislators that are trying to uh, fix John's bad reasoning. And so in November 2021, Democratic New York State Senators Brad Holyman and Jamal Bailey introduced the Rap Music on Trial Bill. And that's been backed by the likes of Jay-Z, Meek Mill, and Fat Joe, which would ban the use of art created by a defendant as evidence against them in a courtroom in most cases. In July 2022, a new bill titled the Restoring Artistic Protection Act was introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives by Georgia Representative Hank Johnson and New York Representative Jamal Bowman. The app name Rap Act aims to protect artists from the use of their lyrics against them in evidence in criminal and civil proceedings. I don't know how you could do it in civil proceedings. I could see a lot of instances where it would actually be relevant to a civil case. I think in criminal cases, it's not okay. So this is this is probably a little bit of a longer episode. This was intended to be a legal brief, but this trial is going to start eventually, unless everybody please out. And we just wanted to talk about some of the things and some of the questions that have been posed. So show up for your jury summons. Do not yell things at the judge. And maybe look at that book or look at some of this legislation and see how you feel about it. And the topic of art as evidence is always going to be an interesting one. And hopefully we'll find a good place where we can draw the line. John, do you have anything else? Or should I be afraid to ask that question? Uh, no, there's nothing else. I, um, I'm looking forward to my journey due to uh, in a week. Thank you. Which I'm not on yet. So I'm, I, I'm going to go get interviewed or I have to do the, the process. So you get, so here's what happens. You get your jury summons, which John got in the mail. It's a little postcard. Oh, what if I get sequestered? You're not going to get, oh my God, that's so rare. Okay. So you get your little, you get your little card in the mail and it says when to show up and then you can go on the court's website and it'll give advice. I highly recommend bringing a book to read. 
Don't just rely on your phone. Bring something that you can read or do while you're sitting there. And most of you are not going to get picked. And most judges are very reasonable, especially if you have small children at home, about letting you leave. If you have something medical, if you're taking care of your ailing parents and you're the only caretaker for them, there's lots of good reasons why it's reasonable and acceptable to miss jury duty. However, if you just want to get out of it to not do it, I don't condone that. You'll get there and then you'll get sent to a courtroom and then it's usually about 35 to 40 people in a panel. Only only 12 of you will get picked and then there'll be like two or three alternates depending on how long the trial is going to go. And most trials are not that long. Most of them are small motor vehicle accidents. It'll only take a couple days, but you get to be the fact finder. You get to decide who gets what and what happens. And that's really important and it's valuable. I agree. I agree. I'm going to be there with a smile. Thank you. Good attitude. Thank you. All right. I'm not going to start saying things just to get out of it or something or calling the judge a bitch. Which, by the way, he's bringing that up because of the show Jury Duty, which we started watching, which is hilarious. And I definitely recommend it. It's on Apple TV, right? Right. I think it's Apple TV. We're not getting paid for this, but it's a funny show and it's really good. Yeah, I like it. Okay. All right. Well, we're done. Bye, legal team. Thank you so much for listening. Send Ceci good vibes her way. And don't forget to check out our Patreon and join us on our Instagram. And we also have our website, thebravodocket.com. And if you have a correction or a complaint, go ahead and email us at thebravodocket at gmail.com. And also thank you guys so much for your five-star reviews. We really, really appreciate that on iTunes and it really helps the podcast. Bye, legal team. Bye, guys.